Scripture lesson today comes from Nehemiah, the fourth chapter, verses 15 through 22. Nehemiah writes, When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. And from that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the soldiers wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. And then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, The work is extensive. And spread out, and we are widely separated from each other all along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there, and God will fight for us. And so we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. And at that time, I also said to the people, Have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Today we are blessed to celebrate one of those great days in the history of the church when God was on the move and, and transformation was in the air. Today is the day of Pentecost. In the words of my dad, Pentecost is one of those times when God's reaction within creation created rushing winds and tongues of flame a deafening voice that whispers to those whom God has chosen. Fifty days after the Jewish feast of Passover, it was a time of celebration in, in God's act of salvation for the Jews in Egypt and, and, and the forming of a new nation, one that was truly under God. 120 men and women were, were gathered together when suddenly, God decided to speak. And with the rushing wind and the tongues of flame, God intervened in the human experience. And suddenly, these almost illiterate Galileans were speaking in languages of all those around them. To people from all the nations around the world. Now, some of those who were gathered thought that they were babbling, that, that they were filled with new wine. Peter, Peter, filled with God's Holy Spirit, stood and began to speak. And God used his words to, con to convict many of those who listened to the role that they played in the crucifixion of Jesus, the Messiah. Broken and convicted within their hearts, they cried out, brothers, what must we do? And Peter said to them, repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, so that your sins may be forgiven, and, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, and, and for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. What a wonderful day that was. 3,000 claimed the name of Jesus. And the vision that God offered to the people began in earnest. Peter and the disciples moved out from their hiding, out from their waiting and wondering about what was to come. They moved out to risk their lives for the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter, the one who fearfully denied Jesus in the courtyard three times, proclaimed Christ as Messiah with the very same abandon that he had on the mountain at the time of the transfiguration. 
And, and the people, the people cried out, what does this mean? Well, it means that troubled hearts are healed. It means that the path has been perfected. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, says Jesus. It, it means that, that for three and a half years, as Jesus laid the groundwork for a vision that would share the gospel throughout the world, the twelve could hear it, but they couldn't heed it. They could desire it, but they couldn't discern it. They could point to it, but they couldn't personify it. It wasn't until Jesus sacrificed himself that they would be able to risk themselves. And on this day so many years ago, God gave them the gumption to risk themselves, to share their story, to go into the world and proclaim the name of Christ. Such is the vision of holiness. We can't call others to a life we are not willing to live ourselves. As a pastor, I'm constantly pointing people towards the hope that comes with holiness. No matter how hard life gets, God can redeem our hurt and our heartache and He can use the depths of our despair to bring light into our life and love into our world. But there are times. There are times when hope is too hard to hang on to. <laughs> Back in 2018, I ran the worst marathon in my life. It took me five hours and 32 minutes to run 26.2 miles. And I finished that race horribly humiliated and completely crestfallen. The only thing I could say to my benefit was that I would finished. And I vowed that I would never suffer that experience again. I claimed that, that I would rather never run again than to suffer such an ordeal. It, it didn't take long though for my humiliation and defeat to be transformed into dedicated determination i became obsessed over my training regimen I, I ran daily i altered my diet and i i looked to friends and family to hold me accountable a and when it came time for my next marathon i owned it and redemption was mine I can't imagine living without ambition. There's so much that I want to do, so much that I want to accomplish personally, professionally, spiritually. Ambition is, is what keeps me going and it, it rouses me from slumber and it pushes me out the door and it forces me to, to reach beyond myself and it, it calls me to sacrifice far more than I care to sacrifice and it encourages me to risk far more than I should. Ambition is what keeps me in the fight or, or it keeps me in the race when everything and everyone else is telling me to quit. The caution that ambition insists I must concern myself with is that I must always remain privy to what is my vision versus what is God's vision. And, and this is exactly where we find Nehemiah. You see, the trouble we are in, Nehemiah tells his people, the trouble we are in is that Jerusalem lies in ruins and, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and, and we will no longer be disgraced. Well, is that Nehemiah's vision? Or is that God's vision? Is, is Nehemiah seeking personal glory as the man who defied the Persian Empire? Or is Nehemiah seeking to reclaim the promise of God for the people Israel by reclaiming and rebuilding the holy city at the direction of the Almighty? 
There were many who believed his vision to be arrogant and egotistical. A personal vision rather than a prophetic one. What is this you are doing? They mocked and they ridiculed. Are you rebelling against the king? Nehemiah believed otherwise. The God of heaven will give us success. His servants will start rebuilding. In in other words, we're going to do that which the Lord requires of us. Folks, we're entering a period of rebuilding, of reclaiming the promise of God for the people of Grove City and of Grace United Methodist Church. That promise is not simply to reopen our worship venue and to go back to what was. It is to reclaim the presence of God in our midst, not just in our sanctuary. But dare I say, even more importantly, is to reclaim God in our homes and in our workplaces and yes, even in our play. Having just come away from Memorial Day Remembrances, I I came across a story from the spring of 1940. See, the German army was plowing through France, and and, and despite help from more than 300,000 British troops, the U.S. troops weren't involved in this battle. The Germans surrounded and trapped most of the Allied forces at Dunkirk. It's a town in in northern France. And it appeared that the Allied army would face annihilation, or at the very least, surrender. Well, through a miraculous outpouring of courage, the British managed to organize an amazing flotilla of hundreds of little ships that, that evacuated most of the Allied forces. But before the evacuation took place, at one point when everything looked totally hopeless, the story goes that a British officer sent the following message, condensed into three powerful words. But if not... See, at the time it was a strong message of courage and, and of ultimate hope in the midst of trouble. The message conveyed that the British would stand defiantly against the Nazis and that God would provide a way through the darkened night. There was a Nebraska newspaper article that went on to explain the background to that three-word message. But if not, came straight from the King James Bible. If you remember the story of Daniel, the prophet Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they faced the fiery furnace in in chapter 3 of Daniel, and they they refused to go down in defeat. Instead, they declared their trust in God, even if their mission failed. You see, according to Daniel 3, 17 and 18, they said, if it be so, Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. But if not, words from God that still speak to our heart today, but if not, Words of of hope and courage when the world seems dark and hopeless. But if not, words to live by and for some words to die by. You know, almost everyone I talk to wants to know when we are coming back to worship in the sanctuary. And, And my best response is this. The God of heaven will give us success. But if not, May the world be able to say of us, Grove City Grace United Methodist Church was faithful in the face of this virus. Your giving and your service have been exemplary. But now, now it is time for us to reclaim and renew Christ within our hearts. 
Our lives have been put on pause, but, our grow, but growing our faith can wait no longer. And, and my hope and my prayer is that you, Grove City Grace United Methodist Church, you will unite together in faith to grow faith by engaging with and participating in the outpouring of our small group offerings. They're designed to create community by building relationships, to grow grace through service and fellowship, and to strengthen our spiritual fervor by drawing us closer to one another in prayer and closer to one another in scriptural ponderings. So hear this. If we are not being discipled in small groups designed to strengthen our hearts, our heads, and our bodies in heavenly service and understanding, we are stunting our growth and we're stunting our church. Let us not forget that our purpose as the family of God here at Grove City Grace is to glorify God through prayer and worship and to nurture believers to evangelize new disciples for Jesus Christ as we serve our neighbors near and far with the love of Jesus. As Nehemiah continued to work, half the men were working Half the men were watching, constantly on guard, so that the vision of God to reclaim the holy city could be fulfilled. How can we do the work of God? How can we do the work of discipleship? How can we reclaim Grove City and Mercer County for God how can we bring new souls into the kingdom of God if we ourselves are not guarding our hearts from evil or at the very least guarding ourselves from apathy towards the Almighty by being discipled? We will get back to worship. We will be safe in the house of the Lord. That I will promise you. And what a great day of rejoicing that will be. What a wonderful day of celebration and song. A day when we will claim victory over all that would cause us to stumble in faith. But if not, we here at Grace United Methodist Church will be faithful. Praise be to God. Amen.